Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Webinar Wednesdays with the Belfast Met. My name is Nick Bridge Paul, and today's topic is the practical and realistic use of 3D printing for manufacture. Before we begin, can I just ask that if you have any questions, to please type them into the chat box, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. Today, Bill McEwen will be presenting to you. He is a lecturer in aeronautical engineering at the Belfast Met and specializes in engineering design and digital engineering methodologies. So over to you, Bill. Okay, thanks, uh, Nick. Um, can I just ask, is there anybody who can't hear me? That's probably the easiest way of asking this. No, right, okay, great. Right, um, okay, uh, I'm going to make an assumption uh, in this that not everybody is terribly aware of exactly what's involved in 3D printing. Now, I I'm not, I'm not going to go into the specifics of, you know, precisely what 3D printing is and how it works, but I'll start by giving uh, a, a bit of an overview of it so that anyone who is not even slightly familiar with 3D printing can at least get a handle on this before we go much further. But specifically, this presentation is about describing how fused deposition modeling, which is the, the, the type that we're focusing on here, actually has practical application in industry. And there is there's a large gap in engineering where it could be being utilized and it's not actually being particularly widely used to date. And that's most likely because of the lack of awareness of what the capabilities are. So I'm going to show two case examples, which should make it very obvious where the applications and the advantages are. Now, before I do that, just to, to give a, a, an overview of our facilities. This is our printing room. It's also our material test room. So what you're looking at is a space which is partially used for curriculum delivery for students, but is more used with our industrial programs. So companies that partner with us, either for knowledge transfer, knowledge development, or even uh, product development, they would uh, join us here in the laboratory. Now the, you can see the, the black and orange printers running um, the two sides of the room. Those are our, our main workhorses. There's another six of them that you can't actually see in that picture. Um, those are the, the, the type that we use the most and they're representative. These ones are moderately sized. They're about 250 by 250 by 300 mil. Um, there's no real limit to the size of these machines that you can get. We, we don't have anything much larger than that, but the, the principles with the machines are exactly the same. You can make them as large as you want. In the same room, we've also got our material test equipment. So here on the left hand side, you can see our uh, universal test machine. So we can do compression, tension, 3.5 point bend testing. Um, it's also fitted with a video extensometer. So we can do non-contact biaxial um, stress and strain uh, studies for anyone who wants it. And, it. and again, typically that's something that uh, even outside of curriculum, we, we use with industry because it's, it's a machine that not every uh, SME would have access to. So we, we, can, we can offer these kinds of services. In the center, you can see our impact test machine. We can do Izod and Sharpie, five joules all the way up to 50 joules. So all of your plastics testing all the way up to your very high performance metals of um, significant uh, proportions as well. We can, we can do that using those that machine there. Um, here on the right hand side, you're, you're looking at one of our larger FDM machines. This one is particularly, uh, I'm going to use the word special, because it has two extruder heads, which means that we can simultaneously print more than one material at a time. Um, that will make more sense as, as we go through. And then below here, bottom right, you can just see a close up of one of those um, smaller machines that I was talking about. Okay, so what's it all about? Why, why, why do I think it's important to introduce the topic of FDM? Well, because typically for most industrials, when I say 3D printing, they think one of two things. One of them is this, toys. 
Okay, so in this case, I think it's uh, uh, Pikachu. Yeah, that's about as much as I know about it. Okay, it's a small model uh, made on an FDM printer. It could be made on the FDM printers I'm talking about. At the other end of the scale, we usually see things like this. So when you go to industry shows and conferences and expos, you're almost guaranteed to find several stands where you're going to see objects like this. So here we've got a case of one of these organic formed components using optimized topology and it's been 3D printed uh, in metal. It's very exotic, very expensive, not really intended for any real practical application. It's pie in the sky stuff. So these are the two extremes. At one end you've got completely non-functional, totally aesthetic and just fun and pointless objects. At the other end of the scale, you've got exotic prototyping for expensive R&D, stuff that you show off to, to, to other companies to show your capabilities. And this is the general perception that everybody has, which is what I want to explode, because it's not this. It doesn't need to be this. Um, just as I'll, I'll just glance by this, just to make it clear, there are lots and lots and lots of different techniques for 3D printing and, and I've just listed some here. We are focusing specifically on fused deposition modeling so that's using thermoplastic filament that is then heated and extruded through a nozzle in a, a two-dimensional sense to build up a three-dimensional object. And we use like I said machines like this. So this is just to give a, a rough idea, just for those who don't know how these work. You've got three axes, X, Y, and Z, describing your, your Cartesian three-dimensional space. So any object you want to make fits inside of the space. Here in the center, you can actually see the extruder head. So this is where the filament is being melted and then extruded to make your, your planes, which you then build up. You could think of it as though you were drawing sketches on the pages of a book. And as each page flips around, each of the drawings builds up on top of one another until you've got a three-dimensionally described object made up of these layers. For those of you who might have a composites background, it would be analogous to building up your plies when you're making a composite. So what can we do with these? Well, for starters, you can achieve geometry that you can't achieve under normal circumstances. This is an additive process, not a subtractive one. So literally, gram for gram, I can properly find an object so that it comes out net finish. Okay, so if I'm going to use 10 grams of material, I'll use 10 grams of material, not 15 grams because I'm removing material after the fact. This is a key advantage in terms of sustainability, also just in, in terms of cost. The two objects that I'm showing here are just they're a little playful, but they, they get the point across. You can manage geometry like this. And in terms of the time it takes to manufacture these objects, well, the time is exclusively dependent on the volume of material used, not on the complexity of the shape. The complexity has an impact, but it's low in comparison to the volume. So that bunny rabbit there would take roughly the same amount of time as a simple cube if the cube had the same volume of material in it, approximately. Um, another application that we see, this is a little bit out of uh, the industrial view, but I, I, I'm not really aware of exactly who's in the audience. Um, <clears throat> one thing it, it's, it's now being used for quite a lot is verbatim reproduction of objects. So in, in this case, we've got a, a Roman sculpture that's being 3D scanned, uh, laser scanned. A scan like that, um, we can easily uh, turn into a, a digital model in a normal CAD platform and from there move on to making the, a model in FDM. So that particular sculpture there, if I had the 3D scan for it, which probably I'd be able to find for free using some of the available platforms, I could actually reproduce that. So it means I could, I, I could produce artifacts that maybe I wouldn't normally have access to. Nested geometry is another um, key advantage. So by nested, what I mean is I can print an object inside of an object inside of an object. So the part on the left there, you can see those sort of geodesic hollows and they're all printed one inside of the other and they move around. 
So there was no need for assembly. And, and in that example, there would have been no way of making that under normal circumstances. On the right, you can see an example uh, made using metals. So again, there's this idea that we can cut down on a lot of processes. In this case, it would be assembly. You can also get electrically and thermally conductive materials. So it's entirely possible now to print circuitry. Now that might sound exciting enough, but the real application there is that we could embed circuitry. So the circuitry could be inside the structure. Now, because I can print more than one material at a time, what that means is I could have an object, a structural object, but inside of it, made at the same time, simultaneously, an electrically conductive circuit. That offers uh, enormous potential. Things like um, live health monitoring of structures would be an example, as well as cutting down mass and complexity as well. You know, no need for discrete circuitry. Architecture is somewhere where we're seeing actually quite a lot of pickup. So um, the ability to produce a let's say a scale prototype of a building so that things like scale and access can be tested. It's, it's now becoming quite popular with architects. We've, yeah, I've done a little bit of work with architects already on this and they, they, just, they just love it. It's very, very much um, an applicable um, science for them. Fashion, um, although I'm not involved in this, is also seeing a lot of uptake for this. But to be fair, this is coming back to the playful side of printing. So I think I'll, I'll gloss over that one. Um, sculpture, obviously, um, artists like it as well because it, it allows them to test out capacities that they wouldn't normally have access to. New materials and different techniques. In terms of the materials, we've got all sorts of possibilities. We're not stuck with um, materials of, of one optical character. We can have transparent and translucent materials. Uh, uh, PET and polycarbonate being the two key examples. Interesting one here is polycarbonate. The machine that I showed you, which is well, about 650 pounds as a kit form, can print polycarbonate. So it can produce good quality engineering products of, of fairly high performance. You can get um, the polymers now seeded with various um, reinforcements glass fiber, uh, carbon fiber, carbon particles. It tends not to make them necessarily significantly stronger, but it does make them stiffer and it does give them far, far superior geometric tolerance. So you can you can get down to really quite, quite close tolerances with these materials now. Um, also casting. So anybody involved in uh, investment casting in engineering, we, we usually start off with a mold. We've got to go ahead and make a mold in order to then pour the wax into, then you take the wax and you do the lost wax process. Now we can literally print that part. So I no longer need the pattern. I can actually bypass a good 20 to 30% of the process of investment casting. Major, major advance that. You can have metal fills. In fairness, they're not particularly brilliant for structural applications because it tends to weaken the polymer, but you can have the aesthetic properties and the conductive properties as well. You can also, this might be surprising, it might not, depends on how much you know about printing, we can print rubberized materials. So you can have completely flexible compliant structures printed out using the FDM technique. And going back to what I was saying about being able to print more than one material at a time, if you had dual nozzle, you can see an example here. On the left, there's two polymers. So these were printed simultaneously. The red is the structural part and the white is a support material. And importantly, the support material is water soluble. So what we're able to do here is print an entire clock mechanism, drop it in a bucket of water, dissolve out the supports, and then you get the product on the right hand side, a fully assembled, pre-assembled, finished net clockwork mechanism, all in one go. So this is again me pressing the point that there, there is capacity with these machines that you, you don't have in the other techniques. Um, 
So just to, this, this slide is just to make it as simple as possible to understand. What you've got is a, a filament. Okay, so you buy this in. It, it, think, think about a, a, a roll of fishing line. That, that's what it pretty much looks like. That is being fed mechanically into a feed unit, which usually comprises of a heat sink. Now the heat sink is there to try and prevent the heat from rising up into the driving mechanism and also to ensure that the stiffness of the filament remains intact until you reach the hot end of your, your device. The reason being that the solid filament is the piston that is driving forward the liquidized material, the material that you've melted. That is extruded through a nozzle. That nozzle could be anything between 0.1, one, even one and a half to two millimeters in diameter, depending on how fast and how coarse or how fine you want to print. And all you need to think is that this needs to be moved around. Okay, so in your X and Y axis to describe that two dimensional structure that I was talking about. You then raise it up by some small increment and you print the next layer on. That might be a bit clearer on this slide. So what I'm saying is, here's the three dimensional object you want. What you're doing is you're printing discrete layers, all of which pile up one on top of the other, fused, okay, melted onto each other, and that's what's giving you your three-dimensional object. Okay, so from an industry perspective, um, the typical complaints I hear are things like, you can't make things of accurate dimension. That's not possible. It's gonna be you know, no better than half a mil. And, and that's just not good enough for our purposes. I hear that one quite a lot. I also get the complaint that, oh, the materials that are available are weak. I mean, they're, they're just, they're not engineering materials and they, they have no realistic strength and we can't really use them. Uh, another one is that it's a slow process and it is. So the bunny rabbit, for example, that I showed you, that was, I think, uh, 20 hours. It took 20 hours to print that. And that sounds terrible, doesn't it? 20 hours. It took 20 hours just to make that. But the key point was from the point I had the design to the point I started printing the bunny rabbit, the delay was zero. The printer was next to the computer. I went straight from CAD to the printer without even getting up out of my seat. There was no delay. In essence, there is no lead time. Um, this, these last points here, uh, generally speaking, there seems to be a lot of caution around these machines. Uh, they must be very complicated or sensitive. They're gonna need a lot of maintenance and you need a lot of expertise to know how to use them. Uh, and this is another key, key problem. It, it, it's not the case. If you've got a fundamental understanding of basic computer numerical control, then you can run these. And in fact, you don't even need that. There are plenty of amateurs out there with 3D printers who are happily printing objects of choice out without any knowledge of CNC whatsoever. Uh, so my responses are that first of all, it's, it, it's not an inaccurate process. We can get down to 10 microns on those simple machines. You know, careful tuning, careful maintenance, you can have 10 micron um, control over these objects. And that's more than good enough for most processes. You know, unless we're making parts for NASA, you don't really need that much better tolerance control. Um, the issue of saying that the materials aren't strong. Well, how strong do they need to be? I mean, how often do we complain that the plastic products that we have around our house aren't strong enough? If they weren't strong enough, we wouldn't keep buying them. Uh, manufacturers wouldn't make them. I think the key point is that we keep trying to find ways of making objects in plastic on an FDM printer that would otherwise have been made of some other material. What I'm suggesting is think plastic. You know, what would you make with the plastic and make it with FDM instead of an alternative? Um, I've already mentioned about the complexity of the machine. Uh, the key point I would say about knowledge about how to use them, um, that's essentially what we do in the Met. Um, so Nikita, who, who introduced me there, um, he liaises with companies who want to learn these skills. Uh, they come to us and, and these skills are, are then developed at no cost to the company, I, I should point out. It's state funded essentially. And it doesn't take that long to learn, okay? Um, also, the, the number of materials, the different kinds of materials that you can get just keeps increasing. So 
now we're at a point where you can print uh, materials like Peak, Old 10, very, very high performance polymers with fantastic mechanical, chemical, thermal properties. That's, that's all now possible. In addition, you've got a lot of other very, very important advantages. The first one is design flexibility. For any of us that are like roughly my age or older, we were all trained, you know, to design objects using available technology. So we have a tendency to design components and parts and products with a view to how we would make them, knowing how we would normally make them. The whole point with FDM is that we can break out of those paradigms. We can start making objects in, in different ways, you know, ways that can save time, money, material, um, improve sustainability. The other point being, you can diversify your product chain. If you've got FDM printers in your company and you're using them to make some product line that you've got designed, if at some point you want to diversify and develop a new product line and it's significantly different to what you were making before, <clears throat> traditionally, that would mean retooling. Well, now you don't need to retool because as I've said it before, the machine doesn't care what the geometry is. It doesn't. It simply needs the pattern loaded to it and it can reproduce it. So you can go from making one genre of products to making a completely different genre of products without the need to reinvest in new tooling and apparatus and technique. Uh, another really big advantage is no storage. So if you've got um, a line of heritage products out on the market, people have them, probably you're taking up a significant amount of space somewhere, keeping a stock of heritage spares to support those products for the next two, three, five, ten years. Well, what if you didn't need to do that? What if you just went to the printer and you, you made the, the replacement part only as and when it was needed? Now you've cut down massively over overheads in the, in the form of storage. Another big advantage. And then importantly, and I think for the industrials out there, predictable and accurate costing. The software that we use to program the printers to make the part the software is also, you know, it, it gives you a precise delivery of time and a precise delivery of material used. So you can get your costing analysis at the same time as you're doing your design. It's, it's not a separate process that you have to go into and have to invest in. It's data that just falls out the other side of the process. And it's very accurate. It's very, very close to what you're actually getting. And the last point I'm making is, is the sustainability. Again, this is an additive manufacturing process. We're not gouging out, machining out, drilling out, punching out material, which then becomes waste. We only put in what will come out the other side of the process. So if the end product weighs 10 grams, I'm only going to use 10 grams of material to make that product. That's the key point. And of course, we're using thermoplastics, so they're entirely recyclable. Okay, these points here, I'll, I'll just go over these quickly. Uh, I, for those of us that are in manufacturing, some of the big problems you've got is you get a machine and after so many years of use, it becomes obsolete. It's not got enough capability for what you want or it's starting to break down and you go back to the manufacturer and you discover hmm, it's not supported. Okay, or I can't upgrade it. The, the, the company won't do it, or I can't find someone else who will. The whole beauty of these FDM printers, the ones that are open source, is that they're completely open source. You can go into them. The designs are freely available. The software is freely available. So that's the, the actual software running the hardware on the machine and the software you were using to create the files to make the part. All of it's free, okay, if you use open source and all of it gets interfered with by people all over the world. Millions of people interfering with it and sharing their knowledge and their design and their capabilities, all of which you can take part in. So this machine that you had, now it's five years old, you want to change it, now you can. Chances are somebody else has already done that kind of process 
the data is available straight from the internet. We can take advantage of all of these individuals who are essentially doing um, R&D work on these machines, saving you countless hours and, and uh, enormous sums of money. Also, key point, because these machines are now becoming ubiquitous, there is no limit to the spares. You know, if there's 50,000 copies of the same printer that you've got out there, there's going to be spares for those. those. Those spares are not going to disappear on you in the next 10 years. So your machine will stay fully supported. I, for me, this is, this is a huge advantage. A machine that I can tinker with, I can change it to make it the way I want it to be. And I can do the same with the software and I can be confident that it's not going to, I, I'm not going to have the rug pulled out of under my feet in the next five years and find I'm stuck with a machine I can't tinker with anymore. I can't adapt it or change it. Okay. So just to get the meat and potatoes of this, here's an object. In this case, I've chosen a little battery box. So it's a little box to take uh, three AAA batteries. Okay. So the reason I've chosen this is because you can all picture in your heads pretty much what size this is, kind of rigidity it would have. You've all used a wee battery box and something. So I've chosen this because it's a typical example of where traditionally we would use injection molding. The injection molding is the go-to for your, your, your plastic pots. So just there, I've, I've got some data there. It's not particularly important, but for anyone who, who's, who's interested in the absolute specifics, it's there on the slide. So let's imagine that we were making this using injection molding. Okay. Um, again, if you're not familiar with injection molding, don't worry about the data you see on the screen. All I'm indicating here is it, it's a very typical um, routine that I'm suggesting here. This is the overarching data that I've put into a, a, a simulation. I've given the link, by the way, for the simulator there. And yes, it's free. So you can, you can go online and use it. You just use that link that I've given you. So I've used that to do prediction on cost per part for this little battery box. And then I'm gonna show you the result for FDM as well. Uh, one thing I, I need to point out is the software I was using, it does have a key flaw, and that is that it can't calculate waste material. So in the image you see on the screen, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six parts, but these sprues that you see running between them, that would all be waste material. And it's significant. That's getting getting up for somewhere between eight and ten percent of the volume in this little example. The software I used can't predict that. Just, just want to make sure that that's clear. So the graph you're looking at here, this is a classic, classic injection molding graph. What's the cost per part versus quantity? And let's just keep this simple. What would you pay for a little plastic battery box? Well, it's going to have to be something less than a dollar, right? Well, look at the graph. How many parts do you need to be making before it's going to cost you less than a dollar? You're up into the tens of thousands. So that's great if you're predicting making 50,000 products. What happens if you only want 500? Would you make it with injection molding? Well, I know I wouldn't. Now that battery box is going to cost me about six, seven pounds a piece. It's just not cost effective. This is the weakness of injection molding. Now we have a look at FDM. Now I've been the best case scenario on the left and the worst case scenario on the right. So it's going to be somewhere between 15 cents and 24 cents to print this using FDM. Let's even just take the worst case scenario, 24 cents. Okay, to make one, it costs me 24 cents. If I make 10 of them, it'll cost me 24 cents per part. If I make 100 of them, it'll cost me 24 cents per part. Because the cost of making the thing with FDM is constant. It's not dependent on how many you make. When you injection mold, the reason it's so expensive is because you have to make the mold to put in the machine to make the part. The FDM machine doesn't require that. That's why the cost always remains the same. So if we go back to our graph, it's all the way up here at 35,000 parts you would need to be making with injection molding 
for the cost to be the same as FDM. So the reason I've put this example in is, is well, because it's, it's, a, it's a huge impact, okay? I'm saying that you would need, using the traditional technique, which injection molding, that's what it is, you would need to make 35,000 of that part for it to cost the same as if you just used FDM, using a printer that costs about 700 pounds to purchase in one go, okay? I should point out, sorry, that with these costs, um, these were based on a moderately priced filament. Uh, it's around about £20 per kilogram of the filament that I'm talking about here. Oh. Come on. Right, okay. Um, the next example um, I've got, this was um, a partnership that we had with a, with a company called ConveyorTech. Some of you might, might have heard of them. They make um, conveyor devices for various industries, all the way from uh, postal sortage and product sortage, right the way through to quarrying. So, you know, moderately sized equipment all the way up into the gigantic equipment. Now, they're a typical example of where the printing comes in because each of their products that they might be making, they might only be making, such as you see this in this photograph, might be making only 10 of these in a year. What you're looking at here is a magnetic screening table. So you've got two surfaces with embedded electronics within them on two legs, and there's the conveyor belt running between them. Basically, they're just trying to, to make sure that no metallic parts are coming through with the, the rubble that they're passing along this belt. Okay. Now, how they made it originally was they bought in a billet of material. This is a particular material. Um, pretty much nylon, just think nylon. The solid billet was then CNC machined, okay? Notice the big aperture in the center. So the first thing that they did was they cut out that gigantic block. Something, um, a little over 50% of the material in the original block just went straight out, waste material. And then of course, obviously all, all these little bits that have been machined out as well, okay? They came to us. And we worked with them on using open source printers, open source software, moderately placed filament. Could we make, um, using the same geometry, a similar product that would perform in exactly the same way or better, and would that cost less or more? And could they then go on to use the machine for something else? Well, that's what we did. There's the 3D printed version. Now, you might notice from the photograph that it's in parts. It's because my, my printers aren't large. I could do this with a printer in one shot if it was large enough. We just didn't have a large one. But since the technology, um, the, the way the machines work is precisely the same irrespective of size, the data that we got for, for this will be exactly the same as for a large machine. Okay. You can see I was using a, a very low tolerance here. This was a, a 0.3 millimeter nozzle and I was running it quite fast. Um, but even at that, you can, you can see how fine the detail is, e even with relatively low resolution. It doesn't act, it's not as slow as you might think. And then there's the data. Now, I can't give you the specific data um, because of uh, the, the company's demands on control of their data. So I've non-dimensionalized it. So everything's going to be in percentages. Cost, 96% reduction in cost. So like for like, the original table machined out of the solid versus the FDM printed version. The FDM printed version was 96% lower in cost than the original. Now, for me, that, that just says it all, 96% reduction in cost. Mass reduction, 69%. Now, oddly, that turned out to actually be significantly important because what it meant was that the handling of the apparatus to get it onto site and fit it and put it in place became substantially easier because now like one man or, or woman could, could pick this up quite readily and move it onto site and fit it. Delivery time. 60% reduction. Now, I'm not saying that the printing was faster than the CNC machining. The CNC machining was faster, but here's the key point. 
To get it CNC machined, they had to go to a supplier, buy the billet. They had to wait for the billet to be delivered. There was a lead time on that. Then that went to the company that did the CNC machining, and there was a lead time with that as well. And then eventually the finished part came back to Conveyor Tech. It was quite a significant lead time. So even though the manufacturing process was faster, the time it took to get the part was significantly longer. Thus, the FDM version, because we simply went from computer to printer, was 60% shorter. That's a, that's a very, very large advantage in manufacturing. Waste reduction, 99% which is obvious if, when we go back and we look at the, the object, okay? So originally, we've carved out that gigantic portion out of the center of it. You, you know, massive waste already. Here, this is hollow. Actually, I should, sorry, I should have said this. You can see it in the, the simulation here. You can see the, um, the, the mesh structure that I've got on the inside here. So it's, uh, I think, if I recall, I think it was 15% I'm not sure I've got it on the slide. Yes. Okay. 15% of, of infill, or if you prefer, it was 85% hollow. That's also the reason why it was significantly lighter. So huge, huge reduction in um, waste material. Other improvements was increased rigidity. So with the original part machined out of the solid, it tended to bow, it tended to bend under its own weight. That, that had some, some knock-on effects with the way the table performed. The FDM one, because it was significantly lighter, it had a higher stiffness per mass. So it had much, much better um, rigidity, which turned out, we hadn't planned on it, but that turned out to be a much, much larger advantage than, than we would have imagined um, for the company. <laughs> um, the other one, the, the, the one that I wasn't expecting, was color choice. So we were able to go and get a filament that was colored um, the same as the corporate coloration for the company. And for them, that was, that was important that their product actually had their corporate color. We can achieve any color we want. And importantly, it's not a step. If I, if I was making something out of a metal, for example, I'd have to treat it, prime it and paint it to get it to be the color I wanted it to be. With FDM, you know, it just, comes out the color that you want it if you use the colored filament that, that you're intending. Uh, so um, this, this point here is just some of the other things that the, the, the company, this particular company were interested in. They wanted to be sure that they were looking at a technology that they could adapt again, that they could use to develop other product lines that they, they hadn't previously considered because it always meant outsourcing manufacture there was a it was actually quite an interesting one we, we, we did by accident because they're working with conveyors they're using lots of um, pulleys and the diameter of the pulleys um, dictates basically the speed of the conveyor so when they go on site if they want to tune the speed of a conveyor rather than interfering with the controller quite often what they do is they, they change out pulley diameters but that means they've got to go back to the manufacturer of the pulleys and get new pulleys made. Whereas now that they've got the printer, all they do is they go and print the pulleys and they go off to site with a box full of varying diameter pulleys that they printed off pennies ago. They go on the machine, they fit the, the, the pulleys on, mm, that's a bit too fast, put a smaller one on, or that's a bit slow, put a bigger one on. No need for spending time doing um, difficult analysis. It, just go out and test with these pulleys that they make themselves. If the pulley wears out, they replace it. And they don't have anything in storage. They just go to the printer and they print new pulleys. Okay, so it's, it's just getting back to this idea about the flexibility that you can have. You can, you can essentially establish anything that you want but within reason once you've got this technology in place. Oh, um, Nick, do you want to jump in and talk about this? So thank you, Bill, very much for that. Any any further questions? Um, please don't William, hesitate. Oh, sorry, Nick, William. Uh, sorry, Jerry, I came in later, later into the, the webinar because I was on another team call. Um, okay. Having looked, that was the MLX, that was the uh, NRC and, and Ulster as well. 
when I've been going down the road before as an investor with my client and looking at prototyping and things like that for, an or for, for, for a particular uh, product and mm-hmm. was looking at injection mold and tooling. The real thing has stopped me actually starting it now because obviously I look at the Chinese prices, the, yeah. the, the, the Belgian prices, obviously, um, the, all different parts of the world, obviously, and then you, you, you look at onshore versus offshore, the cost of manufacture, and the fact that there's going to be two parts, ABS composite material, which need to be put together by hand or automated in that sense. So, but, yeah. I mean, the cheapest, I mean, injection mold and tooling, I mean, the cheapest I probably find is about seven or 8,000 pounds in China until about 12,000 pounds, you know, perhaps, you know, in Spain and things like that, you know, and then, as you say, when you're modeling the graph, you're looking at sort of 35,000, you know, before you actually bring it down to the cost price of an FDM product, you know, type stuff, you know, and then yeah. you, know, you got the flexibility. So what sort of, in relation to printing, I mean, first of all, one, if I was going to do a project like this at home and we do a smaller scale, you know, but obviously control the flow as opposed to, you know, and obviously less setup costs and the more flexible in that sense, you know, and then the printer could be used for other things as opposed to paying for a piece of P20 injection mold and tin steel, which is in China or another country in the world that I'm never going to see, I'm never going to hold in my hand. You've obviously got the risk of having a 1-2% defect rate at the start, which then yeah. becomes a 5, 10, 15, 20% defect rate, you know, and obviously can be your product, you know, um, IP can be, once you give across the solid edge, solid work files, any NDA in the world isn't going to sort of matter to, to a country or part of the world with recognized Western international property and can change it, you know, and haven't been along that line before in manufacturing. Yeah. All right, one, what printers would you recommend? Back to my initial question, is there a selection of printers? Obviously, the cost, obviously, variation. Yeah. One, two, are there any companies or SMEs currently offering this service, north or south in the island of Ireland? You know, which is right. uh, for, 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 for small, for obviously small industry, you even can't spend a thousand, two thousand pounds on a printer, or is it the skills to do it? Buying equipment's one thing, obviously, it's having the technology, having the Oh, all right. Yeah. Sorry, um, sorry to jump in there, Bill. Do you want to take the first one, and I'll take the second question? Yeah, sure. I, yeah. I, I was actually, I, I was thinking actually, the logical way of answering that was working backwards from your last okay. point forwards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's probably what Nick was thinking there. First, what Nick can detail this for you: skills development, knowledge development, and product development. All of yeah. those things we can do with you, and funded through various mechanisms at no cost to yourself. And I, I would recommend that, that, that you and Nick um, talk about that in more detail. For the machines that you were describing, it, it's something that I, I, I sort of glossed over here. You can buy the recommended industrial printing machines. Yeah. If you're willing to spend 30 to 40 to 50,000 pounds, But what annoys me about those machines, and and I'm really, I'm very specifically using this word annoyed, is that they are not better than open sourced technology. It's quite possible to get a large scale FDM printer. So let's say one and a half to two meters of throw in the X, one Mm. meter in the Y, one meter in the Z, big, for less than 20,000 pounds. That's very very possible and there are manufacturers who are offering this and more to the point those machines you can choose what software you want to run on them you're not stuck with the bespoke software which normally in my view having used it translates as not very good you're not stuck with that anymore you use whatever software you like and that and, and by that i specifically mean open source software so that there would be no cost to you and you can tie that in even into seamless processes. For example, have you ever tried using Fusion 360? No, no. Uh, are you aware of it? No, I wasn't. Any sort of CAD stuff I did before was uh, was uh, Solid Edge and Solid Works. And, and, okay. And... If, if you can if you can drive Solid Edge or Solid Works, you can yeah. drive Fusion 360. Okay. Now, Brilliant. Fusion 360 is an Autodesk product, mm-hmm. but you can get a free license for it. And the beauty of it is, it's got three things I like about it, is that from the one platform, you jump from CAD to CAM and to print without moving. And you can go backwards. So if I've got a part I've designed in the CAD part of Fusion 360 and I jump to print, I don't like what I'm seeing there in the parameters and I change the parameters there, it feeds backwards 
into the CAD part and the change will show up in the CAD part. You know, so I don't have to jump in and out of software. That's a, that, that, that's a key advantage. But even if you weren't doing it that way, say you were using your SolidWorks, you can jump from SolidWorks to any number of open source platforms for slicing, for printing, that won't cost you anything. The licenses are absolutely free. And there are enormous communities of people using that software. So any question you have, you can get an answer to. You'll not be waiting for someone in a call center or someone in support to get back to you. That doesn't happen. You just go and get the answer or even ask the answer. And sorry, ask the question and you'll get yeah. the answer. Um, but yeah, you can, you, you can get large scale machines um, quite easily. We're working on actually building our own large scale machine. We just found it, we're, we're, we're tied into all sorts of problematic purchasing regulations in the college. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm, I'm sure you know sure. about it. We've, sure. we've, yeah, go so, ahead, sorry, go ahead, Nick. No, 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 Bill, I, I was going to say, have you finished answering that question? Just, <clears> just I'm trying well, to... I, I don't know, Jerry, are, are you happy with that answer? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I always like I'm picking an email down the line, days as well. But in the future, yeah. we don't have any more stuff, you know. Please, I'll put put my email address in in the chat box on yeah. the in there. So, if any of you are interested in learning more about three D printing, working with Bill McEwen, um, there is uh, funding available to pay to learn more about this, um, please don't hesitate to get in contact. My email address will be in the chat. Um, Nick, sorry, I, I, I can't see a question. And I think we, uh, 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 Darren Hawhey, Darren, you're asking about what our in-house capabilities are. Were, were, were you here for the start of the slideshow? Uh, I, was, I was in maybe a minute or two after, so maybe just missed that. Okay, um, we've, we've got a range of FDM printers going from moderately sized 250, 250 by 300 mil all the way up to one machine dual, uh, dual extrusion, 12 by 12 inch by two foot. It's, it's, it's quite a tall machine. Yeah. Yes. Um, we, don't, we don't do DLP or any of, of, of that stuff. We have the machines, but they're very little application. And as you've probably heard there, we're working on uh, larger machines. We've also got a full suite of um, testing equipment. So tension, compression, three-point, five-point bend testing, impact in Izod and Sharpie, low to high um, energy ratings. So we can do, a, other than um, hardness testing, we can do the, the full suite of um, material tests that you might want to do. ASTM, ISO, doesn't really matter what it is. That's great. Uh, that's, that's good to know because you know, traditionally I'm used to sort of smaller scale, you know, maybe 12 inch by 12 inch bed kind of thing. So yeah, it, it's good to know. It's good to know you have that in house. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great guys. So like I said, uh, my email address will be in there. If you do want to delve into this further with Bill, do send me over an email and we'll get a conversation started. Um, this is the fourth webinar in the series. So please do have a look at Eventbrite for our future presentations on things like the future of work and design thinking. Um, that's it for us today. Uh, Bill, any last words? Uh, no, no. Okay, perfect. Yep. Thank you guys very much and have a great day. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, bye-bye. Bye-bye.